Yeah. Okay, so this morning I did a bit of a poll of our banding community to find to ask the question, what were the first three Edward Gregson pieces of music that you ever played? Now my three were Prelude for an Occasion, Divertimento for Trombone, and oh, yes. Laudate Dominum. Before I, right. I was about fifteen by then, I reckon. They were my right. first three. So so we did a poll across the band. Now obviously I couldn't believe how many pieces there were that came up. There were so many. It's fantastic, you know, which just goes to show how busy you've been with that pen. Uh, but the top three, would you like? Well, I'll tell you yes, at the same time. Interesting. Third, yes, think... third place was Partita, which was a fourth right. section test piece. What year right. did you write that? Can you remember? 1972-ish, and that was a commission from Redbridge uh, Youth Band. Okay, there you go. Second was Prelude for an Occasion. Yeah. Wrote uh, that which of... 1969 for Black Dyke for their okay. first that was the that was the first piece I had commercially recorded oh wow on, okay on, yeah on on there's a picture I remember the LP is Black Dyke I think in front of Huddersfield Town Hall organ wow funny enough anyway okay. there yes it was written it was written I think for Black Dyke okay and then number one probably won't surprise you was Laudate Dominum of course right yes which okay and we've actually played both versions at Ambition. We've played the older version and we've played the newer version, and they're both fantastic. Uh, yeah. What my, well, I'm not going to go into that one, but time. So, uh, but it's a great, I love that piece. Absolutely love it. And some of the people on here were saying earlier, we mentioned Loud Art, and they said, oh, we're going to be singing that all day long now. And sure enough, you do, you know? Now, talking of that, I guess it's a good uh, segue to my next point. Uh, you use a hymn tune at the start of that, of course, Loud Eye to Dominum. Yeah. But I love the way in your compositions that you, the way that your compositions start. I love it. So, for instance, so I'm going to go into, you know, more uh, close to home. So, Rococo Variations, what a yeah. fantastic start to a piece, you know. Uh, and then uh, of, of Distant Memories as well. A, just a beautiful, what glorious sound in brass band. And I think that's what you said when we talked about brass bands five minutes ago, about that sound yeah. that yes. brass band makes. It's just incredible. Yeah. So, uh, I'm just trying to think, where can we start? So could we talk a little bit about Roco Rococo then? Yeah. Uh, and sure. how that came about. So that was a commission. It's a Baroque theme. Tell us a little bit about that piece. And you're, obviously well, there were six yeah. tributes within that piece, weren't there? Yeah, okay, so first of all, interestingly, just drawing on something that you just said, Paul, um, it's interesting that Laudate Dominum, like this new piece, right, here, so here it is. <laughs> Available. <laughs> here's a, here's a yeah. plug, folks. Get your, <laughs> yeah. get your copy now. If you go on to Andrew Baker's More Than Veld Publishing Limited, you can buy the study score for a yes. mere 12 pounds. That's only yeah. the price of two pints of beer. Anyway, um, it's interesting that you mentioned Laudate Dominum. What's the thing about Laudate When do you hear the theme, Paul? When do you hear the theme in Laudate Dominum? Oh, praise ye the Lord. Yeah, but well, when do you hear it in full? Oh, do you hear at it the end. end? Exactly. You don't yeah. hear it until the end. Yeah. With Rococo variations, it's different. You hear the theme, which, by the way, is a Baroque-like theme, but it's actually my own Baroque theme. Okay. You hear that at the beginning, and then you hear the variations. With Laudate, you don't hear the theme until the end. So when I came to write this piece, World Rejoicing, which is hopefully we're going to hear in Birmingham in, se in September, hopefully, um, I, I took the same kind of idea you don't hear the tune until the end of the work. Of course, it's a different piece to Laudate in many ways, it, you know, because it's about 30, 40, 30 years more when I wrote it. Or no, 40 years, my God, terrible. So it's a, it's a more mature Gregson piece and it's more difficult than a Well, it is, it certainly Laudate. is, but, you know, as soon as it starts, it sounds like you, you know, it's just got, I don't know, I can't, you know, I can't describe that. I'm not a composer, but as soon as it starts and, and we get into it, it's like, it's so Gregson, you know, that must be, well, I mean. You see, well, you see, you asked me earlier, and this is an interesting thing, isn't it? What makes it Gregson then? Because you asked a question about style. What is mm. it that, that identifies one composer's style against another? Yeah. 
I can't answer that. You, you, you can answer that. I can't. But there's, well, you know. Well, I mean, for example, let's let's say the great composers. Let let's say you can always tell a piece of Beethoven or a piece of Brahms or a piece of Tchaikovsky or Rachmaninoff. There's something yeah. about the way that their melodic utterances happen, or the way that motives in Beethoven's sense, you hear a motif, which is you know like obviously Beethoven five, but da da da, but da da da. Beethoven builds a lot of his style, stylistic development, on motivic development, which is something that Brahms took up as well. But there is something about the way that a composer uses harmony, the way a composer uses rhythm and texture and, and, and orchestration as well, very course, important. Yeah. There's something about that that makes me different from someone else. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know what it is, but if you say, it's so Gregson, then you'd have to tell me what that means. Well, it, I'll have to think about that and get back to you, but it's just, that what an in incredible sort of tool that is. It's like Harry Potter, you know, <laughs> you can just, there we go, have a bit of Gregson, you know, and it just oozes <laughs> out at you. I love it. So in, in that piece, you uh, sort of gave a nod to six uh, of your favourite brass band composers, of course. Yes. So would you just yes. quickly talk about those a little bit for us? Because I think yes, no, that's an so, interesting so point. That, yeah, that ties in nicely with what I said earlier about you asked me the question about who influenced me when I was a young composer. And I said, OK, let me tell you about, about my wider musical influences orchestrally. But then if you specifically say what influenced you in writing for brass bands, which was to come, which brass band composers influenced you? So, right from an early age, this is quite obvious, I grew up in the Salvation Army. The two finest composers who have ever written music for the Salvation Army are Wilfred Heaton and Ray Stedman Allen. By far, those two guys can live with anybody and they can actually live with most brass band repertoire, be it liturgical or non-liturgical. Mm -hmm. I mean, those two composers are terrific composers. I, I tend, by the way, I tend not to use the word great. Everybody these days says great. They call me great. <laughs> I, am, I am, I am, look, I am not a great composer. Let's face it, I am not. And I'm not being modest. Great composers for me are Mahler, Beethoven, Brahms, whatever. I'm not a great composer. So those guys weren't great composers, but they were very influential composers. And they were quite original composers. So let's take Heaton and Stedman Allen as the first two. Then um, one of the, one of the, two of the next, compo the two composers who I think influenced the brass band repertoire a lot were um, John McCabe and Philip Wilby and Elgar Howarth, those cool. two. And then the one going back to the same time as Stedman Allen and Wilfred Heaton, who I have a very great affection for because I knew him quite well and that was Eric Ball. Oh, well, of course, yeah. Because so Eric, you... Ball was, Eric Ball was a conservative composer. He wasn't by any means a modernist composer. He wrote in the style of, of, of um, Elgar, Liszt, uh, you know, uh, those composers. So he wasn't adventurous at all. But he had a terrific technique and he had some memorable ideas. So when you look at certain of his pieces, like Journey into Freedom and Resurgam, those pieces are are still being played today, sure. you know, 60 years after they were written. Yeah. And that's the sign of a, an influential composer. So I've mentioned all six of those composers that I wanted to dedicate uh, a, a variation to. And I use a little quote from each of their music, as you know, in the variation. Sure. Well, that's why I introduced you as an influential musician to me, because you were the person that introduced me, really, to Eric Ball and to Wilfred Heaton, really. Although mm. I'm a Salvationist, I, we, we played Resurgam. I remember we recorded it with a Welsh band in Llandaff, yeah. BBC. And also, do you remember when we went to Norway? That was a long time ago. Yes, but we, I do we remember. We played Takata by Wilfred Heaton, which is still one of my favourite brass band pieces. That's an absolute cracker. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember who who the principal cornet was then? I do, Gareth Small, of course. Indeed, and he played yeah. the Dennis Wright concerto on that tour. He did. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And then he's been, of course, principal trumpeter of the Halle now for the last twenty years or whatever. Great, great player. And when I say great, I mean that he's a great player. Yeah. Yeah.